You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and we are back into big time tournament season. Uh, I went down with SB Fishing and HP and, and the gang, and I got to watch them uh, t- drowned, honestly, uh, throughout practice and then tournament day. And I'm up with the guy that cracked the code for Smith, uh, B- Brody Lucky. Thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me. Dude, you got it done with 24 pounds. I'm not going to lie. Uh, we we have a little pool that we do in the house about what is going to be the biggest fish and what are the weights going to be. I had 21.5. And until you came to the scale, I was feeling pretty damn confident. I was an ounce off. Um, and then you right. dropped that hammer. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. It was a blast. Now, uh, guys, as always with this, before we get straight into the tournament, I saw that you fished for Liberty Reservoir. And, and honestly, how did you get into this crazy thing of bass fishing? Um, I mean, ever since I was four years old, my grandpa took me to a little creek and I caught a little creek chub, maybe that big. And ever since then, it's I live, eat, and breathe it. It's all I do. It's all I think about. And I've just run with it ever since. You know, fish as hard as I can, fish in ponds, lakes, rivers, you name it. I'm out there. Did you get to do high school fishing? I did. I came in third in one MLF uh, uh, high school event. Oh, nice. um, Mountain. And that was the only one I fished. Um, Due to COVID, I didn't really get to fish that many. But, um, yeah, I only got to fish one, but we did pretty good. So how did, then did you get connected with Liberty? Uh, I know Liberty cause at the time when they first started out, there's like one or two teams. I think they were sponsored by like legend boats, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I mean, it, it was a really small program and now it completely blew up. Right. Yeah. Um, so in high school, you know, obviously looking to go to college, uh, get a degree and I was looking around, looking at teams and I saw Liberty had a t- fishing team. Um, I've been thinking about playing baseball. I had a couple offers to play baseball, but okay. I wanted to finish college instead. Um, and so that's what I went with. And I did a tour to Liberty. I liked it. Um, I got signed up and then I, um, messaged the president of the team and, um, I told him about some of the tournaments I'd fish and he was like, yeah, you're good. Come on. So I was like, wow, that, that was easy. So yeah, got on the team first year. Um, didn't do great. I had, would have came in fourth in an MLF event on the Potomac, but we got DQ'd because my partner thought we were going to be in 15 minutes earlier than we were because he didn't look at our slip. Um, but that's past information now. But uh, What, what yeah, year was that? That was 2022, I believe. 2022. 20, yeah. And then we qualified for a national championship in Florida. Um, had a... I I think it was big fish of the tournament. They didn't pay for it, but I had an eight, four. Um, Whoa. whoa, whoa. Yeah. Yeah. You're scooping through all this. So like, what was it like being, you know, in dead nuts? So if you guys don't know, Liberty university is in Lynchburg, Virginia, right? Really? There's not a lot of places around there besides Smith. And now you are basically going down to Florida for the first time. Correct. Like that's gotta be a little bit of shell shock. Right. Yeah. It was definitely, um, weird. I mean, it was, very different from anything I had fished. Um, and we cracked the code in practice, um, went into an area, caught a seven and an eight real quick and left. And then unfortunately the wind changed direction on us and blew out our area. Um, but we got two bites in there all tournament and one was an eight and one was a six. So, um, but yeah, it was definitely a whole new ball game down there. You know, Smith being a deep, clear reservoir and Florida being a shallow grass fishery. You know, it was just a curveball, to say the least. How much experience did the Potomac give you for that? Or, or, or were both kind of like going tidal grassy and then Florida grassy? Was that just all of it, just one big learning curve? Right. Yeah, I tried to relate it to the Potomac as best I could, but it seemed like Florida is more of like a, you catch one or two big ones maybe three if you're lucky and that's how you do well whereas the potomac's more of a numbers deal you know you catch a lot of three and four pounders there um so i had with the mentality like maybe throw the same baits, same style of baits through the grass stuff like that 
Um, and I've fished a couple other grass fisheries as well. Um, but yeah, I picked up a lot of chatterbait, swim jig, you know, started punching and was able to get some bites. Um, caught my biggest fish on a glide bait over a uh, um, shell bed. Damn. And my buddy saw it blow up and he's like, dude, that's a big fish blowing up. I said, where? I look back and it blows up again. I'm like, oh, shoot. So I chucked my glide over, over there. I go, walk, walk. And it just <laughs> loads oh, up. Dude. Yeah. It was, it was fun. It was an eight, four. I think it weighed. Oh, you gotta be shaking. Holy crap. <laughs> I was jumping up and down. The, the boat was shaking for sure. Holy crap, dude. And I know we, we were talking before we got started about like, I guess, mindsets and strategies of fishing, the run and gunning approach. And when you talk about Florida and the Potomac, it's interesting because I've had Billy Coles on the show like a thousand times. You know, you talk about Brian Thrift, people like that, that do this. I have 200 waypoints color coded on my GPS and we're gonna hit all of them. <laughs> And you go to Florida, is that like, oh shit, I have to take my whole philosophy out the window? Because a lot of times it's, this is the grass bed that we're going to camp on for eight hours. Right. Yeah. And in the Potomac, I actually came in 16th in the regional. Um, and I sat in one spot all day. Like I'm, I didn't move the boat a hundred yards all day and I was catching on a frog and I literally just made circles, but I had to work it so slowly. Um, that I knew when I saw fish bust, I could catch that fish because I put the frog on his head and twitch it and leave it for like 15, 20 seconds mm. and, then twitch it and they'd blow up on it. Um, I had well over 20, 20 pounds worth of bites a second day. I just couldn't keep them buttoned, but, uh, they kept popping off for whatever reason, but you know, is what it is. But yeah, I mean, definitely that mentality is you kind of got to throw it out the window and just be like, okay, I'm gonna let the fish tell me what to do. You know, let the results of where I got bit determine where i spend my time that's hard though and it sounds like it didn't take you very much time to adjust philosophies there are guys that just suck if they come from like that that north carolina carolina vibe of running and gunning that's a hard transition to make because you have that voice in your head saying like i haven't used the big engine at all like i gotta move it's it's weird and it's um I guess it's just having confidence that those fish are there and taking what you saw in practice and being like, okay, everywhere else I went didn't really get bit, or maybe I had one or two other areas that I can go check if I need, you know, need be. But for the most part, I mean, just stick into those areas, knowing that it's, it's hard to stick there if you don't have the confidence the fish are there. Yeah. But if you have the confidence that, okay, these fish are here and they are going to bite at some point and I have the right bait, then it's pretty easy to stay. But if you're wondering, like, oh, I don't know if I have the right bait. Oh, I don't know if they're here or not. Then it's really hard to really just put the power poles down and sit down for a second. Does that camping mentality ever play on regular, just boring old reservoirs? Or is that a very unique Florida slash grass thing? So for me, it's more of a different mentality of... Yes, it's good to sit in those same areas, but I like to let them rest is the difference. Okay. For instance, in the tournament I just won, the BFL, I showed up to one spot. I caught three or four over four pounds um, using forward-facing sonar, and I stopped seeing them. I stopped seeing fish um, on the rock, in the brush. They were It was just an area thing. They were on a little bit of everything. And so I left, and then... I left it for about three or four hours, ran some other stuff. Not much happened between now and then. I came back and there was double the amount of fish there that there was the first time. Hmm. So there was a lot of bait right there, a lot of fish moving towards that area. And, you know, since I was able to uh, just leave it and leave those fish alone, since I was constantly going over top of them, those fish know you're there. They can feel your transducers panging. And if you just leave them alone, you know, let them reset, let them you know, come back and relax a little bit instead of feeling the pressure constantly, you know, they will come back. I think that's really hard. And I think that kind of gets into like, you had so much reps under your belt. I mean, just alone with the, uh, FLW slash MLF standings. I mean, you look, you've had like 25 events fished. Um, I don't, Lord knows how many of those are, are high school and college. Go, right. so, seven. Okay. There you go. So going, yeah. <laughs> Doing the transition though, and this was something that really bothered me as a, as a, a fisherman was I was big into the high school fishing. I was big into the college fishing and then I was done with college. And I'm like, what the hell am I going to do now? And, and making that transition. What was that like for you? Your senior year of college, bittersweet. Did you already have an idea of what you were going to do 
out of college fishing? Yes, I did. And so this year I'm actually fishing the central division for the Toyotas as well. Right on. Um, and 76th on Gunnersville, I had a little over 16 pounds a day there. Um, I lost one over eight the second day. Um, but it was a great experience, but that's kind of where I'm heading towards, you know, just fishing some of those bigger tournaments. Um, I do work a full-time job, so I don't have the time to go fish like the opens or something like that, but three events, um, in the year I was able to work that out with my work and, you know, be able to fish those events. Why the central? Um, they're just the closest for me and I felt like they matched up to my strengths. The next okay. event is on Lewis Smith in April, which sets up a lot like Smith mountain, you know, a deep rocky impoundment, um, Highland type of reservoir. So I think it'll fish to my strengths. And then Gunnersville, um, I caught all my fish on a trap and I mean, it was just no, something I've never, I've never even caught a fish on a trap from a boat before. You're shitting me. Like, no way. Really? Ever. And, uh, I found one trap. I'm not going to talk about what it is, but it makes a very special sound. Um, it's a Japanese trap and they went nuts for it. I mean, they was in the back of their throats, um, just swallowing it. And I know if I could have, you know, had a little more experience in the grass, maybe found a couple better areas, mm. probably could have done really well in that event with that bait. Yeah, I just I, I'm shocked about that. I'm a I'm a lipless guy. I have probably about eight thousand dollars worth of lipless baits, oh. and half of them you can't find anymore. So I'll tell you guys about them because you can buy silent ones like in black auctions. You can't buy anywhere else that are good. But that that's so freaking smart about picking a schedule that's not just the closest, but like what suits my style. And I think a lot of people don't. So example is if you're not good at Kerr, people will still go fish Kerr tournaments because it's closest. Let's say versus being like no like this suits my style more, I'm going to go there where I have a better chance. Exactly. Yeah. And I figured, you know, might as well um, fish my strengths and, or at least fish places that allow me to uh, execute my strengths. Um, while Gunnersville, you know, it's like a little, you can do a little bit of everything. And then um, the last one's on Chickamauga. And I feel like for that one, again, you really have a lot of options as far as what you can do. You can fish shallow, you can fish deep, you can fish grass, you can fish ledges. Um, there's just really a lot of options to choose from, and I could, I feel like I can really exploit like, my um, strengths in that event. What do you do for work? Um, I actually manage a Waffle House um, over in um, Lynchburg. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, I wasn't wasn't expecting to do something like that out of college, but uh, there was a surprisingly good pay, um, and there's plenty of room to work up, and they gave me three 10-day vacations a year. So three ten, holy shit! <laughs> right, God. right. And since I just joined with them, I asked them, "Hey, can I fish these Toyotas?" And they're like, "Yeah, but it won't count towards your vacation." Um, yeah, they just let me go. They're like, you know, we want you working here. You showed good promise, and you know, during since it's during your training period, you're not actually running a restaurant. You know, go for it. So they basically oh wow, just let me go. Cool. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that was part of the why I went to work there because they were just super understanding. Um, I did work at Cabela's at one point in the fishing department, and it was I was driving two hours each way to Richmond, way too far. Um, I did it for four months in management over there, and it was just too much. But, uh, yeah, they wouldn't even work with me on my fishing schedule, really. You, um, you have and, got to get them as a sponsor, Waffle House. That would be banging on a jersey. Right, that, I'm hoping to get my boat wrapped eventually. For yes. Like, yes. Be like the cool Waffle House wrap boat. Dude. I mean, oh my God. Yeah, I'm going to try to convince them. I can't make any promises. I'm going to get it done, but we're going to try. That's freaking epic. I did not have that on my bingo card when I just, when we got people <laughs> talk. That is freaking legendary, man. Yeah. I hope so. I hope I can get it done. It's, it's going to be tight because they don't advertise. Like, you know, you've never seen a commercial for no. Waffle House. I don't know if they'll let me, but Dude, I'm, I'm going to try to. Yeah. Dude, that's freaking awesome. Um, yeah, wow. With you have everything so well planned out after college. And and so the success that you saw here at Smith, I mean, it really doesn't sound like it, it was more, it was, it was a Hail Mary shock. How much time leading up to this tournament did you have on Smith? I'm assuming based Lynchburg College and stuff, you, you've had a couple of years on this bad boy. Yeah. Well, I grew up in Roanoke, so um, well, since I was 12 anyway. So ever since I was 12, I've been going to Smith Mountain. Um, it's definitely my home lake. 
I mean, I remember going for years and every time I'd catch a bass, you know, I would be over the moon about it. Just so excited. And, you know, I'd see all these guys weighing in these giant bags. I'm like, how do they do that? Like that, there's no way. Like I went fishing, I caught two fish. And so really what led me to, uh, you know, get better was I was like, okay, these guys, they're beating the banks. They know how to do this. They run the same banks for 20 years. You know, I'm not going to beat them at their own game. And that's right about when, you know, side imaging is getting popular. Live scope wasn't out yet. And I really just focused on, you know, learning my electronics. I learned side imaging and I got it down. I fished three tournaments in a row and won every single one of them right off the bat when I wasn't even catching hardly anything. What year was this? Just first, so we can have some, some time stamps. Um, that was about 2015 or 16, okay. somewhere in there. Yeah. Yeah, I think people forget that stuff about GPS when Lawrence came out with their spot one antenna. In college, for me, the spot one antenna for Lawrence was major to line up your cast when you hit a spot. Um, it, I don't know. I wonder if people just didn't bitch about it as much because we didn't, like TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook wasn't as hot in 2015 as it is now. Like, that's my only thing because I felt like people did complain about side imaging back in the day yeah i mean it just it seems like to me like everyone's complaining about uh, forward facing sonar now and to me it's just another tool um people don't realize how important side imaging is and the pros don't talk about it because that's why they they don't want to talk about it because it's so good you know it's so helpful i've spent i don't know well over 100 hours on smith mountain just riding in my seat side imaging market points and now I can pretty much tell you where every rock pile is on on the lake, really. Um, and it's allowed me to cover so much water because by the time you stand up, you know, look at your live scope, throw over it, all this and that, I could have graphed five points and told you how many fish are there, how many rocks are there, and how many brush piles are there. So it's just more time efficient, and it allows you to cover so much more water. Why, why do you think people then, I mean, in your thoughts here, well, why do you think it gets the hate just because it's the new hot thing? Because it's, I, I think it's like a visual thing is they can see how it makes a difference. Whereas when guys gra go graph with side imaging, they just see them sitting in their seat. It's interesting because I really do feel like the bigger, I think the biggest cause of it is social media is so much more, it's everywhere now compared to in 2015. Um, yeah, forward-facing sonar, hundred percent. Now that I got it on my boat finally, uh, and I'm I'm, a, I'm over a year and a half into having it, it's a hell of a tool. I and it's not about just watching the damn fish hit your bait. It's the ability to get instantaneous feedback on if the bait is if the bait is there, and then also how fish react to your lure. And if you have half a brain as an angler, you can make changes pretty freaking quick to get them to bite. Right. Yeah, and really, it's all it is is a faster way of making adjustments. Um, Yep. I definitely don't see it as something that's a problem. Um, I think personally that it's just another way that fishing is evolving. Um, just as when the A-Rig came out, just as, you know, way back when, when the spinner bait came out, you know, guys are like, oh, it's like, it's everything. It's, it's crazy, you know, and, but it's just another tool. It is really all it is. When, you, when you're talking of tools, Mm -hmm. and, and you talked about the side scan earlier and what you're looking for it is when you're dealing with lakes like Smith, is it more important to see the, the cover structure or is it hundred percent bait, 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 no bait don't matter. Um, so it, it interesting to me because it, it seems like it's lake to lake. I can find areas in Smith where they're loaded and I don't see a lick of bait, like no bait at all. Hmm. If I go to, if I don't see bait, I don't see any fish. Um, it seems to me, at least from my experience that, Smith Mountain has so much bait that it's not necessarily important to have bait fish around because there's just so much of it within a certain amount of distance. And really, no matter where you go, there's bait somewhere around. Interesting. That's really interesting. Because, yeah, if you listen to any Bassmaster magazine, they're going to tell you like it, how important having the bait in the area is. But it sounds like whether you see bait or not, that's not the deciding factor on, on whether this is a spot you want to stay in. Right. And for me personally, like when I pull up in an area, I'm more so looking for fish and structure. And you got to keep in mind, you know, you got a lot of crawfish eaters as well. And you're not going to see 
schools of crawfish, you know, swimming around. So, you know, you could not see any bait and have a whole bunch of crawfish eaters all throughout that area and, you know, never know because you were solely looking for bait. Interesting. So, I mean, I think that kind of really leads us into last week and before you even made a cast in the tournament, what was your practice like? Or did you just roll out of bed Sunday and, and yellow it? Or um, so I went out Friday. Um, I only got one day of practice and I checked a couple areas. Um, had It wasn't great. I maybe had 18, 19 pounds. Um, didn't catch all of them, but I mean, I saw some good fish. I caught a big one cranking. Um, I accidentally hooked a little shad like yay big little thread fin shad um on my rattle trap and i saw a fish on my forward facing sonar cruising so i just left it on there and flipped it out there came up ate it five pounder i was like now that just confused me because i was like well he probably wouldn't eat that if that little minnow wasn't on there you know but uh yeah i mean it was it was a okay practice. Um, it was just a lot of one fish here, one fish there, not really anything consistent. Like I got to cover a ton of water to, you know, see the fish that I saw and, you know, find the areas that actually had a couple fish. Like, I mean, it was just, I pull up on a spot, nothing, pull up on a spot, nothing, pull up on a spot, nothing, and then pull up on a spot and there'd be a couple of fish there. It was over, I think it was 64, five on Thursday. And there were beds that we saw. Uh, I saw a couple of beds when I was out there. The fish were a little wonky. Some of the locals were really like, this is weird this, for this time of year. Did you have some preconceived notions going into Friday? Like, okay, I'm going to catch them more in a typical true pre-spawn pattern and then get out there and like, oh, holy shit, they're actually a little bit further along than I thought. So I'll back up a little bit. Last year, I came in sixth in this event. Um, I think it was 17-5. Um, I knew how I was going to catch them before I even signed up for the tournament a couple months ago. Um, I didn't know the areas, but I knew, you know, the techniques I was going to use just cause I'd grown up on the lake, um, seen what I'd seen. But, um, as far as practice went, I mean, um, a lot of my fish were in transition areas and I knew, um, using my forward facing sonar that fish were going to appear the next day, given that it was a cold front. Um, I knew a lot of people would be um, confused and make the mistake of thinking that all the fish are on the bank because it's gotten so warm when the tournament had the, all the fish pull out because of the front. So I knew that those fish were going to pull off the bank that were up there. Um, so I didn't even mess around with them. Uh, I knew they were up there, but I didn't even want to go look at them because I knew they were going to leave for the most part. Now, obviously, some stayed, but I think the majority left. So then you get into you get into the tournament. You you can easily catch 18, 19 pounds like you did in practice. Um, it decided to piss about five inches of rain in in an hour, it felt like Saturday morning. Did yeah. you did you expect that or was that like, oh crap, this is gonna change anything? Or was that going to plan? Honestly, um it, the rain didn't necessarily help me, but the front did. Like normally you hear guys like, ah, oh, it's a cold front, it's bad. With the deal I was catching them on, it it helps. Um, it's going to help your cranking bite, and it's going to help your forward-facing sonar bite. Um, because with the cold front, the fish like tend to go locked a lot of the time and not want to commit to things. Um, so a crankbait being that reaction bite, and then you know a lot of your forward-facing sonar fish show up because they pull off of the bank, um, off of the shallow water where they were. So was your plan to then just... Um forward facing Demiki rig them first kind of thing, get your limit and then go head hunting kind of was the vibe or just hammer down and cover water. So as far as the forward facing sonar thing in my first spot, I had 18 pounds in the first 30 minutes with a seven pounder. Um, so it really wasn't necessarily that I was looking to go head hunting after forward facing sonar. Like I knew I could catch enough to at least be in the top five doing that. Um, I didn't know it was going to happen that quick. But I knew I was going to have at least 18 doing that. Um, and then I looked around some with a suspender bait, um, checking it because um, really one of my main things and one thing I focus on is not having forward facing star be the end all be all. You know, I, you know, after I caught those fish, I pulled up and checked the spinnerbait spot. Then I cranked a bank going into another spot I wanted to check. 
And then I came out and chucked Dasenko up under a dock just to make sure and just kept trying and keeping them honest, making sure I wasn't missing anything um, instead of just solely focusing on one specific deal. What's interesting was now that I've interviewed a bunch of Smith Mountain guys, the mag draft and the glide are always a thing now, especially I think uh, I, I have a real good friend who's a big time glide bait maker. And he says like Smith is one of the best places that you could take a person that's never caught one on a swim bait before they can go there and catch it. Did, right. did that ever factor in your mind of like, I got 18 pounds now, let's just lock a mag draft or a big glide in the hand and let's just knock one out. And and if, if why not? Um, because, so I knew that a lot of the time your mag draft deal is a dock deal, you know, skipping it up under docks, throwing a glides, like throwing it over wood, stuff like that. Um, throwing it around docks, maybe. Um, for me, I, like I said, I knew a lot of those fish had pulled off and I knew I would have fish coming to me offshore. And for me to go then up shallow and try to force something that I personally didn't believe would happen would probably just not be a good idea. Now, if it was slick, calm and sunny or even windy and sunny, just something to do with the sun really seems to help that mag draft bite, um, especially with docks too. Um, I might have given that a shot, but it just didn't seem to feel right for me to go do that when I had caught 18 pounds in 30 minutes and, you know, things were going great. You kind of said something there about how fish stage and you thought that because of the weather, the fish were going to be coming to you. Mm -hmm. A lot of beliefs out there when it comes to fish movement this time of year is they're in their winning areas, they go to their, their pre-spawn and then eventually they go into their late pre-spawn, blah, 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 to spawning areas. But when you get these cold fronts, there's really two thoughts. Thought one is cold front hits, they they go backwards. And if they're in their their last pre-spawn stage before spawn, they back up. Others, they just say like wherever they are in the stage, they just lock down there. They won't back up to the, like their wintering holes. Like what is your philosophy on that? Yeah, so I experienced that 100%. Um, I had one area out at the mouth of a creek where I was seeing a lot of fish on board facing sonar. I'd caught a good one cranking there in practice. And then in the very, very back, there was also fish back there. And come tournament time, I run both of them, and then they weren't there in either one. Um, I don't know if it's that the fish at the mouth locked down. Um, my theory is, is that they move back farther during the rest of the day because it's so warm the day before and then they stopped in that middle area and then when those fish in the back felt the cold front they slid back and in, into the middle again so you had a convergence of meeting halfway back in the pocket mm. and that's where, um one of my areas i just wailed on them so did that initial area play later on in the later on in the day Yes. So the first time I pulled it up on it, I caught three or four over four pounds and uh, um, using my forward facing sonar and I stopped seeing them. You know, I didn't see fish. I was like, they, I, and I had made a bunch of circles around the area and I was like, okay, I probably pushed them down. I'm going to leave it and come back later. You know? So then I went cranking. I caught a good one cranking. Um, one of my fish I weighed in and I caught another good one way up the lake cranking again. And then I ran back down and I showed up to that spot again to see if they come back. And there was double the amount of fish that there was the first time. I'm, I'm definitely a grass fisherman and river rat by heart, sadly. And one thing in the tournaments that I've won and done well in is you find a spot, you protect it. That's just what you have to do. Otherwise you'll have 600 boats going there. When you have a seven pounder and 18 pounds, what gave you the confidence to like not just protect the area, chill there, turn off your sonar, and then just wait for it to come back naturally versus leaving and maybe somebody else coming in there? So the first spot that I caught him in that where I had that 18 pounds, um, I had not seen a boat there in a while. Um, I didn't see any boats in there that morning. Um, and those fish, you know, just didn't like the way they were eating. They did not seem to be pressured. You know, when I'd throw to them, it was, you know, and I'm ripping, ripping, ripping in there, you know, just on it, on it. Like, and you could tell certain areas where they had been scoped and scoped and scoped, you know, like for instance, I pulled in one pocket and I'd throw it to them and they'd go the other way yeah. and they'd come up to it, look at it very lazily and then swim away, you know, and you could tell that those fish have been pressured, but those fish there, 
they hadn't been fished for. You know, they seem to be very aggressive, hot, I mean, ready to eat. How is that possible on a BFL? And then, I mean, you had a, you had a big tournament the weekend before. You had 10 billion people on the damn water. I mean, this isn't a 100,000 acre Toledo Bend we're talking about. Right. Yeah, I will say this area doesn't look like much. Um, it really doesn't look like much. Um, it's just kind of random. Um, but for what I was running, it kind of made sense, like I said, being halfway back. Um, it's one of those things where it's the principle made sense why they were there, but visually looking at it, it doesn't look great. So w- with that said, and you had the 18 ish pounds, you're, you're set in there to get yourself bumped up to 24. Did that happen really when you came back to the spot in the afternoon or was it, you just dinked, not, dinked and dunked, not the size of the fish, of course, but to scrape up to your weight. So that first spot. After I caught the, that seven pounder, I culled the rest of those fish out in a different spot. The second spot I had, because I had two spots where I caught all my fish. Um, the first spot was a morning spot. That's why I started there. Um, they seemed to really kind of disappear, go who knows where, maybe up on the bank. I'm not sure. Um, but they disappeared. And after I came back, I caught three more, but they were just two pounders. Um, and they really weren't there. So, But the other spot, they seemed to be there all day. Um, and that was the spot I went up to. I went in there. I caught, like I said, three or four, around four pounds. I was up to 22 by like 10, 30, 11 o'clock. And that's when I stopped seeing them. I got out of there and I got to fish around for a while, caught another good one cranking, um, caught two more, another good one cranking. And then I came back and they were just everywhere. When did you think you had it? Um, I never did. Um, Even with damn near 24 pounds like that, even yeah. then, holy shit. I've seen these guys like, like two weeks ago, Chad Green weighed in 2986. Um, and in a cat, tra- I think it was a cat trail, but it, it was some tournament, but or maybe a fishers and men tournament. Um, the weekend before 25 on it. Um, but all throughout those are those, throughout- yeah, but those aren't the BFLs with the co angler because every single BFL the weights are always lower than these local tournaments. And after interviewing 400 people, like that's it's always right. the locals, like, oh, we caught 30 pounds here, we don't know why it didn't show out. It's like it never does, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I mean, it's just you never really know until you know you show up to weigh in. Like, I, when I caught my last one, I caught my last one with 30 minutes to go, and I was like, I told my co angler, I was like, I'm I'm done, dude. Like if I get beat, it's because they flat out earned it and I'll, I'm going to make sure I get back on time. So I, it, I was running back and actually someone broke down. So it was probably a good thing that I, uh, oh, shit. Oh. he flagged me down and I picked up a co-angler and the three of us, you know, headed back to weigh in. Oh, so God. yeah, he, he was fishing for points. He only had a couple fish, but he was able to get weighed in. So I was happy to do that for him. That's freaking awesome, dude. Um, I mean, so again, guys, so you know, 2407 to win this thing. You had 2004, uh, sorry, 2407. I can actually read. Uh, 2407 to win this thing. You get 2004, got second place. I mean, I, the weights were way hella lower than what I, what I thought going into this event, being there all week. But again, I think that rain really did screw people up. Um, oh, it did. Are you going to be fishing the Piedmont division or the Shenandoah division, the full thing, or are you just going to be cherry picking the Smith Mountain Lake tournaments? Um, I just cherry picked this one. Um, it just so happened to be because I work six days on, two days off. Oh. Um, fish a ton of tournaments, but it just so happened to be that I had Friday, Saturday off. So it was just like, you know, God opened the doors like you're fishing this tournament, you know, because only it only happens every six weeks where I have Friday, Saturday off. So it just so happened to be on the Smith Mountain BFO. You're gonna you fish the college regionals, you fish the national championships that are multi days. You're gonna be doing the Toyota series in multiple days. Mm-hmm. I really do believe that there is a big ass difference between you being an angler and learning and just fishing one day events and how that conditions you mentally and how you attack the day versus multi day. Being right. an individual that has kind of done both and you've absolutely killed it doing one day events. Are you gonna have to make adjustments because you can't just catch you know twenty four pounds one day and, and call it if you got a three day event. So that's a very interesting question. And I want to say yes and no, because it depends what the fish are doing that I find. You know, if it's like a huge grass flat, you know, I'm going to fish it and I'm going to beat them up, you know, because it's so big that I can come back and do it again. 
Um, I actually had more weight the second day doing that on Gunnersville than I did the first day. Um, conditions were a little better, but you know, uh, I still was able to do that. Um, now if I'm, you know, running like a very specific deal, like it's rock piles, you know, and it's one cast and th that's the fish that are there, then I'm definitely going to have to manage my fish and not beat up on them, you know, reach a certain weight that I think is acceptable and then, you know, go practicing if it comes to that. Do you change your mindset at all about how you approach it when it comes to weight and execution? I mean, a classic example on, um, like even Smith, uh, a couple of people have always done consistently well, you know, Demiki rigging standing timber in like late February, March, you're not going to win possibly doing that, but you'll be solid one day event that doesn't show out, but in a three day event, you might be in the top 10 and it, it's such a dumb thing, but there's so many people that you look at like a BFL standing where they're just always like solid bags, but they're lower because they don't have the winning pattern, but that consistency in a three day event is gold. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Consistency is so important. And I mean, I really try to be consistent as I can and focus on doing a little bit of everything. That's why even when I felt like I was dialed in on a pattern, I still checked other possibilities that could maybe give me a bonus fish or maybe dial me into a second pattern. That way, if the pattern I'm running currently dies, I have something to go to. Are you running, what electronic company are you running? Um, so I run three hummingbirds because I believe they have the best uh, side imaging. And then I have a Garmin for the live scope up front because they definitely have the best one. Do you, since you've been at Smith so long, I, I don't know which one, I guess I'm assuming you have like the Solux or something like that or Apex. Do you download waypoints onto a computer or do you just every year delete it to clean out the hard drive? Like how do you manage your stuff? Um, so honestly, I, all my waypoints are color coded and smart. Okay. And on them so i know like okay this is a rock pile and it's a color so when i zoom out i see all the colors okay you know, so i see okay all these are rock piles when i zoom out i can think 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 if i want to rock piles that day trees are green little tree modicons so i can think 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 if i want to run trees um mm -hmm. and then i have them so i know okay this is good on this time of year this is good on that time of year and i can then run those accordingly that's smart. Yeah, because I, I don't think people talk about that stuff enough is about how important I I was a Navionics. I, I was a Lawrence guy through co high school and college. And I made I'm making the switch right now to Garmin and stuff. But oh, that will save you so much freaking time when you can organize crap and then you can blow it, especially because I think people will. A lot of people won't idle in practice. They just want to catch fish, which is a huge mistake. But then they don't also organize the shit that they're finding to where in a macro sense, it doesn't make sense. But when you sit back at, you know, at the dock and you blow it up and then you can really start putting the pieces together, it's just so freaking crucial. Right. And yeah, it's about like for a lot of people, you know, it makes sense why they want to go catch fish because instant gratification, you know, they catch a fish. They're like, this is good. You know, when they're sitting idling, they don't know what's going on unless they've done it and they're confident in it. Because if you're graphing, you're looking at your, you know, electronics and you see something and you're not confident in what you see it can be extremely tough because then you'll look at it and be like, am I wasting a bunch of time trying to graph, trying to know what I'm looking at? But if you really put your time and know what you're looking at and know what you are seeing, you can have so much more confidence in it and you're able to do it and not feel like you're wasting time. No, that's a hundred percent. Um, since you're a humming brigade, I love mega 360. Uh, is that something that you run or are you completely against it or? I do. I do. I love it. Especially on the Potomac. I was so yeah. cool. This past year, I saw there was this little clump of grass, maybe the size of a school bus, and there was two fish moving around it. And I could, every time it spun by, I could watch the fish move from here to here, and then it spun around again, and he moved over here, and then he'd be over here. And it just showed me like how much fish move. And you can't really scope doing that, you know, like it's just too shallow. Um, but I was actually able to see that fish moving around, and I actually caught that fish because. I kept seeing, he kept going back to two spots, bing, 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 back and forth. And it was so cool to see that, you know, and maybe that's why, you know, when you sit on a grass lot so long, they finally bite because they just, you know, bounce over that spot when it just so happens your bait's coming over. No, yeah, so, uh, dude, a hundred percent on that. I mean, I, we could do a whole uh, seminar on just grass fishing and, and it's a completely different animal than brush and, and bait fish. Um, oh yeah. What what do you have coming up for yourself? I mean, I know you got the Coast, uh, the Toyota series. Apologies. Do you have any other tournaments? The Cat tournaments coming up that you're going to be fishing? Um, so I think not this weekend, but next weekend I'll fish one of the Cat trails on Smith Mountain. Um, this following weekend, 
if I can find a tournament, I'll probably fish it just because, you know, this time of year is great. It's fun to be out there. Um, I'm going to be out there anyway, either there or some lake around here. So, but yeah, it's, uh, I'm going to look for as many tournaments as I can get in. And when I do have the time off, I'm going to hop in a tournament, you know, even if I'm not on anything, I feel like it's good to put yourself in situations where you're not comfortable and make yourself learn rather than just going fun fishing and, you know, not really caring too much. Officially in DMV, we're going to be getting a nonprofit going in 2025. I got per I got permission from Virginia, and I'm on the board for Maryland to do stocking. And the biggest thing is like getting F1s into a bunch of lakes. Right. With the Smith Mountain Lake, they've they've been having the F1 program for five years now. I think. Do you think we'll ever see multiple dirty thirties, possibly a forty pound bag, come out of Smith Mountain Lake? I I don't think there will be a forty pound bag, but I do think there will be thirty. Um, I do. Like I said, Chad Green literally had 2986 this past, like, a couple weeks ago. Like, that close, you know? Like, I mean, just right there. So, you know, I think it's definitely possible, and I think the population is getting better. But one thing I do really think is interesting, I think the smallmouth population is getting so much better in Smith Mountain. And, you know, I mean, it's all kind of off the topic of, Smith, um, of that, you know, the F1s, but it really does seem like that uh the smallmouth are growing in numbers i saw a all smallmouth bag weighed in this tournament i wonder and i don't oh, i'm sorry finish thought what's that oh i thought i cut you off sorry about that um I, I talking to the biologists down there that i've had on the show it seems like the blueback herring are really kicking up and in, in their population and i there has to be a correlation between that and the smallmouth uh really kicking I, off too i I went out there once um, last summer when the blue X were spawning. I had a little right around 25 pounds um, chucking a top water over spawning fish, spawning bluebacks where they were spawning. And I caught a five and a half and a five pound smallmouth, you know, that were just crushing these bluebacks. And, you know, it used to be like back in the day, you know, three pound smallmouth is a good one. Um, the other day I went out at a 590, um, like last week, smallmouth. And, you know, it's just crazy. Like they're getting bigger and they're more plentiful than they used to be. And I love smallmouth, so I'm all for it. I haven't really heard about smallmouth playing at Smith since I think Kevin Van Dam won the, the Appalachian Brawl there way back when. Um, way back. Damn, that was a long time ago. When do they spawn there? Do they usually spawn the same time as a largemouth? Or, or generally speaking, their biology, they, they spawn beforehand. From, yeah, from what I can tell, it's not much before, but it's just like a tad before. You know, like as soon like they'll be on the beds at the same time, but it's like you'll see the smallmouth pull up, and then a couple of days later, or maybe it, depending on the weather, of course, you know, then you see the largemouth. Last question is like, what 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 was the best day of fishing you ever had on Smith Mountain? Anywhere? Or, um, yeah, I cracked forty on a local lake about an hour from my house. Um, about month ago two months ago that's yeah. freaking awesome yeah yeah it, it's crazy i had russ on of uh he runs an electric motor only tournament trail i think that episode dropped last week guys you go look at that because we talked about we talked about um sandy we talked about the Culpeper reservoir we talked about hunting run uh all those little places and it's so crazy that i don't know what it is about these smaller reservoirs the res uh hunting run just cracked a 35 pound bag last weekend um mm. which is insane in frederick why the hell is it all these smaller lakes like do so freaking well comparatively to like a Smith? You think Smith? Oh yeah. That's the one that's going to crack it. Not these little things. Right. Um, I think a lot of them are out, you know, in the middle of nowhere and you've got a lot of guys with John boats that, you know, beat the bank and don't really catch a ton of fish um, unless they're shallow. So when these fish go deep, they're allowed to just relax and grow. And a lot of these lakes have these slot limits, you know, where you can only keep one or two fish. They don't have a lot of tournaments. So they're really allowed, you know, they get caught, they get released. So they're not being brought all over the lake, moved around, and they're just able to grow and thrive. Whereas, you know, you got these tournament lakes where, you, you know, you have some dead fish, um, you have fish being relocated. And that can be hard on fish. Um, just so much pressure. 
Like, I do believe that there's a 40 pound bag in Smith because an eight pounders caught all the time. That's true. But the odds of catching them aren't good because they get so much pressure. You know, I mean, I do think there's similar quality in um, Smith Mountain as there are, you know, these smaller lakes. It's just the smaller lakes, you know, being that forward facing sonars come out, it allows us to fish those deep fish that have probably never even been fished before by the local guys who just go out in their smaller boats. That, Interesting. You know, just, hmm. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that does make some valid sense there. It's, you know, it's interesting because if you look at a lot of the world record lakes up in California, they're not a hundred thousand acres. And I think partially right. my thought is also probability factor. There might be 38 pounders in Smith. And then that makes it a lot harder in a, you know, 26 or 24,000 acre lake to hit and be able to get the right ones at the right time versus a condensed place like hunting run or, you know, um, uh, Lake and call pepper, whatever the hell that name. It just escapes me, guys. Sorry about that. Uh, the other thing is too, when it comes to forward facing sonar, I've had Joe Love, who runs the the Maryland Department of, of Wildlife Resource. I've had Odin Kirk. He's been on the show a couple of times with Virginia. You look at Texas, and you have scope. I mean, we had three or four tournaments this year. Spoiler, guys, that were won with, with forward facing sonar. It doesn't seem yes. to bother those lakes at all. It, how much of it is the forward facing sonar being a problem versus just having the right genetics, food? all that other crap comparatively. Cause I don't know. It's like, it doesn't seem like some lakes it bothers the size. Right. Right. And I think, you know, it goes back to forage base and what they're eating. Um, and like, like I said, these smaller lakes, they don't get brought all around the lake. They get released. So they're not, they get like released like right there, you know, so they're not getting relocated. They're not getting stressed out like crazy and they're able to grow, you know, whereas these tournament lakes, they're just, you know, so pressured, so beat up. I mean, it's just hard for them to really just be left alone and get big. Last thing, what tournament on the Toyota schedule scares you the most or, or worries you the most of, of the three? The one I already fished was Gunnersville. That one worried me the most. I'd never been there. I've been to Chickamauga once as a co-angler in the Toyotas, and I had a pretty good tournament. I made a check, which was my first one. I was happy to make a check, you know. Um, and then Lewis Smith, like I said, sets a lot of like Smith. So I feel like I'll feel at home there. Um, but yeah, I'm, I think I got the one I'm most afraid of out of the way. Now you never know. I might go suck it up on Lewis Smith and same with Chickamauga, but I do feel like at least I have more confidence and more of a familiarity with it. Awesome stuff. Um, is there any sponsors or anyone that you would like to promote and just get thanks to? Yeah. I mean, TH Marine, um, I got them, um, on their contingency program and i run on a lot of their stuff or on their jack plate i got the uh um there's something else on there but anyway yeah i got a lot of a lot of stuff on there from them and yeah that's pretty much the only one so if any other sponsors want to sponsor me waffle house waffle. hopefully <laughs> <laughs> Maybe waffle house one day we'll see Dude, but. that's going to be freaking epic. Uh, again, guys, you know, please go support him. Link in the episode description to everything we talked about, as always. And if you'd like to, go join us on Patreon. We're working towards our goal of starting that nonprofit so we can help supplementally stock all of our fisheries to hopefully get some of these places to start cracking more 40-pound bags. Like and subscribe to the channel. We'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.